Well, now, what type of book is the Bible? When we read the Bible right through in our church, 24 hours a day, non-stop, we began on Sunday evening and we finished on Thursday morning about breakfast time. And do you know 2,000 people came? We sold half a ton of Bibles and all we did was read the Bible straight through. And some poor person got the first pages of One Chronicles. If you know that, it reads like a Hebrew telephone directory. <laughs> it's just names. And apparently they did nothing but begat in those days. And one man begat the next man and he begat another man. And it went on and on and on for about nine chapters. I'll explain why later this, in this talk. But there are some parts of the Bible that seem to have no message at all. And yet they're there in the Word of God. So what kind of a book is it? Or to use a modern term, what is the genre of the, of the Bible? What kind of book is it? Where would you put it in a public library? Well, from one point of view, it's a book of history full of history, and history was my second worst subject at school. It was just a long list of dates and Bible and kings and queens, and I didn't like history at all. I love it now. When I discovered that history was his story, I became really interested. But at school, it was so boring. And when you first read the Bible, it's an awful lot of history in it. Nevertheless, it's a unique book because it begins earlier and it ends later than any other history book you will ever read. It starts at the beginning of history and it ends at the end of history. And there is no other book like that in the world. So it is a history book. On the other hand, I think I'd want to put it in the romance section of a public library. The Bible is a romance from one end to the other. In fact, right in the middle is a book called The Song of Solomon, which is a romance from beginning to end. Almost an erotic love song between a young man and a young woman. But the whole Bible is a romance. It's the story of a king looking for a bride for his son. And that's a romantic story. And it finishes up with a marriage and everybody living happily forever after. I remember one romantic novel that had a misprint on the last page and it says, so they got married and lived happily even after which is a nice little misprint. But the Bible finishes exactly that way. You are to be the bride of Christ. You're not his bride yet. As Paul says, I have betrothed you to Christ. At the moment, we are engaged to Christ. The wedding is still future the consummation of our relationship with him is still future. But the wedding feast of the Lamb will come around and the romance will be complete. And yet it's not a romance. I've written many books, as you know. It's now some 46, dear me. Fancy piling those into a Christian bookshop. But my books are widely misunderstood. The first book I wrote was called The Normal Christian Birth. Now, every book that's published in Britain, a copy has to go into the National British Library for reference, and they categorize it for public libraries. And the book The Normal Christian Birth was categorized under gynecology. And it's now in the medical section of every public <laughs> library. Would you believe it? So I've had letters from doctors and nurses who've mistakenly read it, thought it was a, a Christian version of giving birth. 
My book, The Road to Hell, was advertised in a national Christian magazine as Read David Paulson's Autobiography. <laughs> the Road to Hell. And I guess it sold quite a few copies before they realized. I did write my autobiography. I was very reluctant to do so. But somebody else was threatening to do it. And I wanted to write it myself rather than let anyone else dig around in my past. But I tried to be honest. So I wrote that little book, Not As Bad As The Truth. The title came to me years ago because from time to time, rumors about my ministry go around the world. Rumors that I'm dead, actually. About every five years without fail, my death is reported around the world. And people in Australia ring up to commiserate with my wife. And when I answer the phone, they don't know what to do or say. Um, the next one is due in about two years. And mark my words, it'll come up. So I wrote the autobiography, Not As Bad As The Truth, because as well as rumors of my death, there were a few years ago some lying rumors about what I was teaching and believing. The devil is the father of lies. And these lies spread so quickly because Christians seem to love a bit of gossip. And so I was getting letters canceling my engagements. They never told me why, but obviously when they heard these rumors, they didn't want me. And so the letters just said, we're very sorry, but arrangements have fallen through for your visit which is a nice way to put it. And they were very hurtful, they were lies. And uh, lies hurt, they're painful. It was more painful for my wife, for obvious reasons. And I finally went to the Lord and complained to the Lord. And I said, Lord, they're telling lies about me. And it's not only painful, but it's cutting down my ministry. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, David, the worst they can say about you is not as bad as the truth. And I burst out laughing. I thought, well, thank God they don't know the truth. And you know, it changed my attitude to rumors straight away. And they haven't bothered me ever since. When I went and told my wife in the kitchen what the Lord had said to me, she just fell about laughing. <laughs> and uh, I made up my mind, if ever I have to write my life story, that will be the title, Not As Bad As The Truth. And it has been that way. He did go on to say, David, I know the worst. And I still love you. And I still use you. And that picked me up again thoroughly and helped me to go on. So that's the story behind the title. Well, now I've said that this is a book of history, and yet it's not. I've said this is a romance, and yet it's not. It's more than both those. In fact, to tell you the truth, this is not a book. It is a library of 66 books every one of them different from every other one. And the way to approach a book like that, that is actually books, is very different. The word biblia, from which we get the word Bible, is a plural word. It means books, it means library. And that's what you've got here. And every book is different from every other book. There are books of law, there are books of history, there are books of songs, there are letters. There are many different kinds of books here. And the secret of reading your Bible is to find out what kind of book 
you are reading because they are so different. And that means that the books of the Bible are to be read in a different way, each of them. Each book has its own method of being read. And God gave his word to us in books. I've told you before, I think, but I want to underline it. God never intended to give his word to you in chapters and much less in verses. And so your Bible has been filled with numbers which are quite misleading. They were meant to make it convenient for you to find your way around, and I'm afraid they do. They've made it too convenient. And the word, the English word text, has changed radically. It used to mean the whole of a book. And the text of a book was everything in it except the index and appendices. The text was a whole book. But now to most Christians, text means one statement anywhere in the Bible. And it's being treated now as a box of proof texts. And if you can quote chapter and verse, you can settle an argument, or people think you can. Furthermore, a preacher who quotes a lot of texts in a sermon is not necessarily a biblical preacher. As one old lady said, she was getting tired. She said this to me, I'm tired of preachers Bible hopping to prove a point. And if preachers say, now turn to this and now turn to this, that's Bible hopping to prove a point. And you will find most of the texts he quotes are not in context and therefore taken right out of the book that they're in and invariably given a meaning that the preacher wants to give it to support his own topic. I just throw that out because you need to be very discerning when a preacher gives the impression that he knows the whole Bible and he's simply quoting texts from all over it and not even stopping to think where that text is coming from. Well, you can prove absolutely anything from the Bible by quoting texts out of context. Here's a verse of the Bible. I have met only one man in a thousand whom I could respect, but not one woman. Now, I have preached on that text. The feminists hate it, but it's there in your Bible. It's part of the Word of God. And uh, it's true, because the man who wrote it was that man who had 700 mothers-in-law <laughs> and 300 mistresses on top of that. And if you have played around with as many women as that, you will not respect any woman. And that's why he was able to write that. And there's a profound lesson in that. The more women you treat as objects rather than subjects, the less respect you will have for them. Until when you have a thousand, you'll have lost all respect for all women. What a lesson that is. Or I'll take another text. Well, let me give it in a humorous way. Those who just open their Bible at random and pick a text need to know this. There was a man who did that, or someone, and he put his finger in and it came down on Judas went out and hanged himself. So he thought, well, that doesn't help me today. I'll try again. Go and do likewise. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'll come in a moment to the wrong methods of reading the Bible, but one wrong method is the lucky dip method of reading the Bible, and quite a few still do that. 
and just open it at random, hoping that they might find something helpful for the day that way. So there are many texts in the Bible which are true, but are in context true, but out of context are just the opposite. And there are other texts in the Bible that are not true, yet they're in the Word of God. In the book of Job, most of the book of Job is not true. It is composed of the advice of Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and all of them were wrong. God said they were. They were telling Job that he must be a very bad man to have suffered so much, and that was wrong, and God told Job and them that they were wrong. And yet I've heard preachers quote from Job and from one of Job's friends. It's in the book, it's in the Word of God, it must be true, but it's not true. And we need to know what in the Bible are lies. God has given us those to warn us and to give us examples of people who are not telling the truth from God. So it's putting texts back in context that we need to watch carefully when we're listening to a Bible teacher. I say again, please check up everything I say this week to you. I'm not the Pope. Check me out in your Bible. And I say again, if you can't find what I teach you, in your Bible for yourself, then for God's sake, forget it. So each book in the Bible, the first question you need to ask and answer almost before you read it is, why was this book written? And once you've answered that question, you will understand everything in the book. But if you try and read the book without finding an answer to that question, you will pick texts out that fit. And that's the temptation with the Bible since those chapter and verse numbers came in. The chapter numbers came in from an English Archbishop of Canterbury called Stephen Langton. And they only came in in the 13th century AD for 1,300 years, all Christians had a Bible with no chapter numbers. And it just went straight on. And then a French printer who had to go on a long journey by horse and carriage from Paris to Lyon spent the hours dividing every chapter into verses. And then he printed a Bible with chapter and verse numbers in it, and we've had that ever since. But you can now buy Bibles quite freely through the internet that are without chapter and verse numbers. Nobody shouted hallelujah. Why not? Because you like the convenience of looking up so easily without having to search the scriptures. The Bible tells you to search the scriptures, and if you don't have chapter and verse numbers, that's exactly what you have to do. And it's good for you, because then you always have to find the context before you find your text. And so I recommend those Bibles to you mostly in the New International Version, the NIV, the Nearly Infallible Version. <laughs> and you can get that now without chapter and verse numbers. So do remember that. Let's just run through how people read the Bible. There is the lucky dip method, which I've mentioned. There is the horoscope method of reading the Bible whereby you are hoping to read about today. 
and get some help in living out today. But there are many passages in the Bible that won't do that. They were not designed to do that. <clears throat> this book is not a compendium of God's answers to every problem. He never intended it for that, and it won't do that. It answers some problems, but certainly not all. It says nothing about computers. So if, you go, if you've got a computer problem, don't turn to your Bible. It is actually God's answer to God's problem. The whole Bible is about God's answer to God's problem. Not about his answer to our problems, but his answer to his problem. And his problem can be very simply stated, rebellious kids. And that's a problem that many parents have today. It's far from an unknown problem. What do you do when your kids rebel? What do you do when they become disobedient? What do you do when they don't do what they should? It's every parent's problem and it's the Father in heaven's problem. And the Bible is the story of how he solved his problem. As we go through the Bible, we might find an answer to our problem and the hotel Bibles that are distributed by various movements to put a Bible in every hotel room, you'll always find at the beginning of them an index. Are you lonely? Read some whatever. Are you troubled? Are you this? Are you that? And they've tried to turn the whole Bible into an answer to your problem. But of course they have to ignore the vast majority of the Bible. And if you add up the passages they refer to, it's a minor part of God's Word. Because if that's what you're reading for, you will only read a few selected passages. There are those who have a daily Bible reading course, uh, which is guided by someone's notes. Now, I'm not going to uh, be sarcastic about those, but I've asked so many people who use a Bible reading course with notes, which they give more attention to, the Bible or the notes. And in every case I've spoken to so far, they quickly read through the passage for the day and then they think about the notes and they concentrate on the notes. Happy are you if you read the Bible for its own sake, but you do need help with that. The Ethiopian eunuch whom Philip stopped in his chariot and was reading Isaiah, Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And that's why I wrote the book, Unlocking the Bible. People need guidance, they need help. Not notes on passages, but help. Uh, I think I'm going to tell you how we came to write that book. A group of pastors in a little church in England, um, a little town in England on the River Thames, a group of pastors got together and they found that they were all concerned about the fact that Christians are not studying the Bible for themselves now. They listen to Bible teachers and they sing about the Bible, but they don't get into private study for themselves. And they all came to me and said, could you come and do anything about that? I said, I think I can. And I will come once a month on a Sunday evening if your churches will get together. 
And I said, on that evening, I'll be with you for three hours. You can have coffee in the middle, but altogether I will need three hours. And we'll talk about one book in the Bible on condition that everybody has read through that book before they come, will promise to read through it again after I've been, and that for the next month, all the preachers will use that book for their preaching, and all the house groups will study and discuss it, so that after one month, you have a reasonable knowledge of that book. And I will aim to do two things, to get you so excited about that book that you can't wait to read it, and to give you enough background information about the book that will help you to understand it as it was written. And so I gave them four Sunday evenings, dates, and we started with Ezekiel, I thought, that's a book they probably don't know or understand. So we started with that, and we took three others. At the end of that time, the pastors came back to me and said, David, our people are so excited about the Bible, reading it for themselves, that we want to book you for the next six years. <laughs> and I laughed, and I said, I might be in heaven by then. <laughs> but I did it. And for six years, I went back to that little town once a month and introduced them to a new book in the Bible until we'd covered all 66. Now, I used maps, charts, photographs, anything that would increase their interest and knowledge. And tapes, audio tapes of those talks just spread like a prairie fire. And then I got letters of complaint. We can't see the map. We can't see the photograph. We can't see the model. We can't see the chart. Because it was only audio. And though they were tremendously popular, there were many complaints. And so someone came to me and said, David, you'll have to do the whole lot again on video. And I thought, oh no, not another six years. But in fact, we did it. And it all went on to video, or now DVD, the whole Bible again. And at the end of that, I thought, well, that's that over. And then one of the biggest publishers in London came and said, David, we want all this in a book. And I said, I'm not going through all that again. And they proposed that a young man whom they felt could do it would transcribe the talks on the tapes or videos, and that then I could edit that. He would knock it into some shape and I would finally shape it. And that's how the book Unlocking the Bible came to be. And many people call it my legacy to the body of Christ. Not really happy about that word because I'm not ready to leave legacies yet. <laughs> but I have the feeling that years after I've gone to glory that people will remember unlocking the Bible. And I do to commend the book to you if you're a reader or the DVDs to you if you prefer to watch but they were simply meant to help people to study the Bible for themselves. And my reward is the number of letters I get of people who say the Bible's become a new book to me. And it will if you read it book by book, because very few do. I've told you that we read the Bible right through nonstop in our church in 15-minute slots. Each person read for 15 minutes, passed it on to someone else. And we had no idea what would happen. We just decided to do it. We advertised it, of course. We became known as the Bible Church as the result of that. Um, 
and I could keep you here all morning with tales of how lives were changed, not by anything but reading the Bible, not even explaining it or preaching it, because most people had never heard a whole book of the Bible read. And when you do, it becomes a new book. And we had people coming who would say, I really ought to go, but I must hear one more book. And when they got to the end of that, well, just one more. And there were people who came in the evening to listen who were still sitting there at breakfast time. They were so gripped by the drama and the excitement of God's story of redemption. And I will tell you of just two people whose lives were changed. One lady put her name down for a certain time. Of course, none of them knew what they would be reading. And she never told us that immediately after she had read, she had an appointment with a lawyer to institute divorce from her husband. And she read Malachi. And in the middle of her reading, she found herself saying, Thus saith the Lord, I hate divorce. And she never got to see that lawyer. And her marriage was mended. We had a mayor of the town then. Uh, I'm sure you know what that means. The figurehead of the town, and he always wore a gold chain of office with a big badge containing the crest of the town. And uh, he was a little man called Alderman Sparrow. And he heard about this. He was a nominal Catholic. He didn't go to church. He didn't read his Bible. But he said, uh, oh, he said, I've never heard of a church reading the Bible straight through. He said, could I take part as the mayor of the town? And we said, yes, but I'm afraid there's only one slot left, Tuesday afternoon at 3.30. But you can have that if you're free. Well, he said, yes, I could make that. And he said, I'll come and I'll bring my wife with me. And he said, do you mind if I wear my gold chain of office? And we said, not at all, as long as you wear something else with it. <laughs> and uh, Tuesday afternoon came, and he arrived to read the Bible, but no wife. We said, where's your wife? You promised to bring her. Oh, he said, we've got unexpected visitors. And she's been up since dawn, cleaning the house and cooking and getting ready for these visitors. So she sends her apologies. And she's sorry, but she can't come. Oh, well, I said, now he came and sat down by me. And he said, what do I read? I said, I don't know. You get up at 3.30, take the Bible and read on. And he read Proverbs 31. I'm just testing you to see who knows what it is. It's about the perfect wife who gets up at sunrise and looks after the family and cooks the food. And in fact, she's a real estate agent on the side, so she brings a bit of income in. But he, he read on, and then he read this. Her husband is well known for he sits in the council chamber with the other civic leaders. And he almost stopped reading. And after he'd finished, he came and sat down. He said, I've been reading about myself and my wife in the, in the Bible. I said, that's what most people find when they read the Bible. They find themselves in there. And he said, could I buy a copy? I want to go and read it to my wife. And he went happily away with a copy of the Bible to read to his wife. All sorts of things like that happened just through reading the Bible right through. Amazing. We actually did it again a few years later. 
Well, how else do people read the Bible, or how should they? The answer is very simple. God did not give us his word in chapters and verses. And therefore, to use those in your reading will probably be misleading. He gave us his word in books. And therefore, the way he meant the Bible to be read was a book at a time. And to treat the Bible in a way that you would treat no other book is really quite a big mistake. For light reading, I sometimes read a detective novel by Agatha Christie or someone. It teases your mind and relaxes you and concentrates on something else. But if you took such a detective novel and you started reading it in chapter 13 and read a page or two, and the next day went back to chapter 5 and read another bit, and then you went almost to the end and read a bit more, would you get the message of the book? Would you understand it? Of course you wouldn't. And yet most Christians who don't study the Bible for themselves pick it up in bits and pieces. They never hear a book read through in the church on Sunday. They just hear a little bit, verse 10 to verse 15, and they've got another tidbit from the book. And they treat the books of the Bible in a way they would treat no other book. If you want to get the best out of a book, you read it through. And read it through again. And again. If you love a book, you'll read it many times. And you'll keep seeing things new. I've been reading this book for, oh, how many? Um well over 60 years, and I'm still finding things in it that I never saw before. It's still the most exciting book to read. It's still a fresh book. Now, none other, not one of the other books on my shelf, and I'm afraid I'm a bookworm, and I have at the last count, when we moved house, three tons of books, and it's gone up since then. And I've got two rooms and a garden shed full of books. Books are the biggest blessing in my life and the biggest curse on my wife's life. <laughs> She's recently got me to give some away. And as soon as I'd given them away, I found they were the ones I needed for the next <laughs> <laughs> teaching. And so we have a standing battle between us. She longs, when we're walking along a street and she spots a bookshop on that side, she points out things in the shop windows on this side until we're <laughs> past it. And if I come home carrying books, she hits the roof, not, don't bring another book into this house. But books have been my life. I've been able to sit at the feet of so many other Christians, some alive, some dead. But as you read, you can learn from so many and sit at the feet of others who know much better than you do. And I've loved my books. But the most I've read, I think another book would be about five times. And I always read with a red ink pen. And so the book is filled with red ink and comments in the margin. And that ruins it for second-hand value and for other people reading it. Except if they read all the red bits, they'll get the message of the book more quickly than I did. But some people I lend books to, it comes back with their comments alongside <laughs> mine. And there we are. But no other book on my shelves have I read more than five times. But this book I'm still reading and still enjoying because I read it a book at a time. And then I get the message of the book. And so the first question is, why was this book written? And when you've got the answer to that, you can actually understand everything in that book. But it will color your reading. 
you will read each book in a different way. Let me take a very simple example. There's a book in the Bible called the book of Proverbs. Surprise, surprise, it's a book of Proverbs. It is not a book of promises. And yet every preacher I've heard who's quoted from the book of Proverbs has presented it as a promise. Now, a proverb is a general observation on life, which is generally true, but not always true. You can think of proverbs in your language. They are sensible observations of what happens in real life, but that all of them are not always true. They may generally be true. Let's take an example from the book of Proverbs. Train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from them. In other words, if you take that as a promise, and you train up your child as a good Christian, the child will remain a good Christian in adult life. It's an observation. It's not a promise, it's a proverb. And it certainly is not always true that children of a Christian home follow their parents. And parents have tried to claim that verse as a promise and then been devastated when their own children reject their faith, as all children are free to do when they are adults. Now many choose to follow their parents later in life, but others do not. There's no guarantee. It's not a promise. Here's another proverb, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he shall direct your path. And that has been used as a promise that he will always lead and always direct and even always prosper your business. And Christian businesses go bankrupt. It doesn't always follow. You see, you can apply the Bible wrongly if you don't realize what book you're reading. Just to give you a humorous example, there was one man in my acquaintance, lived in Birmingham, and he was asking the Lord for guidance about whether he should buy a shop in the middle of Birmingham and turn it into a coffee bar for young people. And he prayed much about it and said, Lord, please guide me from your word. And he opened his Bible and he read a verse which said, I have much blessing in store for you. And he thought, ah, store, that's a word for a shop. I've got guidance from the Lord. And he told me about this. I said, don't take that as guidance. Get two or three witnesses at least before you buy that shop. Now, I'm afraid I've used that man's story so many times because so many people read what they want to see in the Bible. And you know, by the third time I'd used it in England, in widely different places, he got in touch with me. And he said, why are you using me in your sermons? And he'd been present in every one of the places I'd used him as a bad example. And so I stopped using that in England, but I'm in Singapore. <laughs> He's not here, is he? The tr trouble is he followed me around. And after the third time, he developed such an inferiority complex that he almost needed counseling. But you see how the book of Proverbs can be misunderstood because you're forgetting what kind of a book you're reading. 
there are books in the Bible that overlap each other. The clearest example, of course, is the four Gospels. They're all about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And they say the same thing so often, especially the first three, which we call the synoptic Gospels. Sun means together, and optic means to see. And synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are so very similar. And many people have tried through the centuries to put all the four Gospels into one. The first attempt was in about the second or third century. And uh, one man who's done it in my lifetime is a great detective story writer called Freeman Wills Croft who was a lay preacher in our town, and he had a hero, a Scotland Yard inspector for most of his books, but one of his books was called The Four Gospels in One Story. And he carefully plaited them all together in one narrative, thinking it would improve the situation and people could get the whole story of Jesus once by reading one story. But you know, he wrecked all four Gospels because they are portraits of Christ from different points of view. And only when you know why one of the Gospels was written will you really understand it properly. Some people have pointed out that in Matthew, Jesus is the Messiah of the Jews. In Mark, he's action man. He's the son of man. In Luke, he's the savior of the world. And in John, he's the son of God. And that's a very good summary of the different points of view. And therefore, they've each used what they can, either from memory or from others and put it together from that point of view. And the truth is, of course, that Jesus is all four. And you will only get the whole truth about Jesus by reading four Gospels and getting each angle, each portrait. John's Gospel is clearly very different from the others. And John proves that Jesus is the Son of God by three sevens. First of all, seven witnesses from John the Baptist through to Thomas at the end, and all of them witness to Christ's divinity in one way or another until you reach the climax where Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He was the first ever to call Jesus God. Others called him son of God. Peter was the first. Do you know who was the first woman to call him the son of God? Lady called Martha, who was very good in the kitchen while her sister Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. But it was Martha, not Mary, who first realized that Jesus was the son of God. But it's Thomas who says, my Lord and my God. There is no higher view of Jesus in the four Gospels than that. Between John the Baptist and Temp Thomas, there are seven people in the fourth Gospel who say, you're divine. Then he uses seven miracles to make the same point most of them different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and most of them far more spectacular, of people who've been healed of something that has lasted years and years and years. And so he's using the miracles and the most spectacular miracles, the godlike miracles, turning water into wine, which doesn't happen anywhere else. He's using these to say these are 
miracles that only a divine person could have done. And then he uses seven <coughs> statements of Jesus, all of which begin by Jesus calling himself God because God's name is I am. And so in John's gospel, you find I am the bread of heaven, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, I am the way, the truth, the life, I am the resurrection and the life. Seven statements which are not in the other gospels but could only be said by someone who was divine. Now, putting all that together, it makes John's gospel quite different. Can I put it this way? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are looking at Jesus from the outside. They have a synoptic view. They're all three writing about him from the outside. John's gospel is writing about Jesus from the inside. But even more than that, in the four gospels, two of them are written for believers and two for unbelievers. And you need to know which so that you don't give the wrong gospel to unbelievers or to believers. Do you know which the two are? Well, first of all, Mark and Luke were written for unbelievers who knew nothing about Jesus. Mark concentrated on what Jesus did, his acts, action man, and Luke included much of what Jesus said. The parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, he inserted into the story matchless stories which Jesus told. But Matthew and John were written for believers. And the difference between them is that Matthew was written for new believers. It was written for those who had just entered the kingdom to tell them about the kingdom they'd entered. And Matthew gathered the sayings of Jesus into five sermons beginning with the Sermon on the Mount. And they're all about the kingdom that these people are now living in. The first sermon in Matthew 5 to 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, which describes the lifestyle of the kingdom. You turn to chapter 10, and it's the mission of the kingdom. Chapter 13 is all about the growth of the kingdom. Chapter 18 is about the community of the kingdom. And chapters 24 to 25, which I took you through yesterday morning, are about the future of the kingdom. And so this whole kingdom gospel was written for new believers, not for unbelievers. It contains statements like, you will be persecuted for my sake and the gospel, but great reward will be yours. That's not written to unbelievers, and we shouldn't expect Matthew to get an unbeliever interested. But John's gospel was written for believers who'd been many years a believer and who were in danger of losing their conviction that Jesus was totally divine as well as totally human. That was because John wrote his gospel in a place called Ephesus, where there was one of the first heretics, a man called Serinthus. He was the first Jehovah's Witness in what he taught, though he didn't use that title of himself. He taught that Jesus was somewhere between God and man. He was part human and part divine. But he wasn't wholly human and he wasn't wholly divine. Somewhere in between. And that, of course, is what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach now. And it is not the truth. And so he wrote in that situation 
as he says at the end of the gospel, he said, if all the things that Jesus did and said were written down, the world couldn't contain the books. But these are written that you may go on believing. That's the tense he uses, the present continuous verb, that you may go on believing that Jesus is the Son of God and going on believing you will go on having life in his name. And every time the word believe comes in John's gospel, it is in that present continuous tense, which means to continue to believe, to go on believing. And I'm sorry, it's never been properly translated. Here, John 3.16, as it should be, for God so loved the world, actually it should be for so God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever goes on believing in him will never perish, but go on having eternal life. That changes the whole verse, actually. But that's why John's gospel was written. Now you know the difference. When you read each of these gospels, you'll read each in a different way. And I give you just two examples. The lost sheep, the parable of the lost sheep, occurs in both Matthew and Luke. Jesus obviously used it more than once in two different ways. In Luke's gospel, the lost sheep is a sinner who needs to be looked for and, and saved. But in Matthew's gospel, the lost sheep is a backsliding believer who also needs to be searched for and saved. So here is a simple parable, lost sheep in two synoptic gospels and yet an entirely different message. To elaborate on that, in both those two gospels, Jesus speaks about a wedding feast and that people are invited, but refuse the invitation with excuses. I've married a wife, I've bought a field, and sorry I can't come, please accept my apologies. And in both cases, the servants are then sent out again, not this time to the streets in the town and city, but into the highways and byways in the country to persuade people to come in and take the places of those who wouldn't accept the invitation. So far, both parables say much the same. But in Luke's Gospel, the parable includes a statement, my house shall be full. And the parable ends with the feast being full of people. It's an evangelistic meaning. But when you read that same parable in Matthew, it ends quite differently. It ends with someone turning up for the wedding of the king's son in his old clothes. He hasn't bothered to change. And the owner of the feast says to him, friend, why have you come dressed like that? That's dishonoring my son. And here is a man who has accepted the invitation and expects to come to the wedding at the end. And the man made no remark, couldn't answer it, because he could have changed his clothes and he hadn't bothered. And so the king said, bind that man hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the message there for believers is, you may have accepted the invitation and you may be expecting to be at the wedding. But if you don't bother to change, you are insulting the sun. And you can expect to finish up in hell. Now that's the message for believers of that parable. Clearly, Jesus used the same story for two different purposes. And Matthew's recorded one and Luke the other. 
Now, you see what a difference it makes to know which gospel you're reading and why it was written. And therefore, your brain gets the right interpretation and the right application. Now, let's take a more complicated example. How are we doing for time? Got 20 minutes yet. One and two kings and one and two chronicles are next to each other in your Bibles. And they appear to be repeating the same thing. Kings re recites the history of Israel. So does Chronicles. So why are they both in your Bible? And many people reading Kings and then reading Chronicles think, I just don't get it. It's the same history. But actually those books are very different. And in the Hebrew Bible, one and two Kings, which are one book, come under the title Prophets. And Chronicles comes right at the end of the Hebrew Bible under the writings. The Hebrew Old Testament is in three sections. First five books, the law. The five books of Moses. Second section, the prophets, which includes the books of Samuel and Kings. They're counted as prophets. And then the third, the writings, which includes the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and last of all, Chronicles. Now, why have they separated those so far from each other? And why do they cover exactly the same length of history? The answer is that the book of Kings was written by a prophet before the exile when they were punished for their wrongdoing by losing the land. The book of Chronicles, however, was written by a priest, probably by Ezra, but we don't know for sure, and was written when they returned from exile. Both are writing the same history from a completely different point of view. A prophet writes that history from the point of view of what went wrong and all the bad kings and all the bad things they did and all that King David did that was wrong. He broke five commandments in one afternoon over a woman called Bathsheba. And from that moment, his reign went downhill. It's a dreadful story. He coveted a neighbor's wife when she was taking a bath on the roof of her home. He uh, committed adultery with her. And then he covered it up by telling lies and by arranging for the husband to be killed in battle. And so he broke, thou shalt not murder too. And that was a tragedy. Prophets concentrate on, on what's going wrong and what that will lead to. And therefore the book of Kings is explaining that they're going into exile because of what was wrong. Now when they came back from exile, a whole new generation had been born that didn't know their history. And in particular, they needed to know three things. Number one, their roots. And that's why the first few chapters of 1 Chronicles are nothing but a list of names, a telephone directory, a begatting. They needed to rediscover their roots. And people coming back from exile who'd been born in exile needed to be retold where they'd come from and who they were. And so those genealogies, those family trees, are given in detail at the beginning of Chronicles. The second thing they needed to know about was their religion. 
about the temple. They'd never seen the temple, about the priests and so on. And so you get an emphasis in Chronicles on the religion that had built up over that same period of history. And the third thing they needed to know was royalty. They needed to know about the kings because they'd been in exile without a king. And therefore they needed to know about the good things that kings do. And so you get a real difference of emphasis and it's worth reading the history all over again to get that new angle. Remember those three words, roots, religion, and royalty. They needed to know that the descendants of King David had come back with them. Now you understand Chronicles. They seem, Kings and Chronicles, to be the same history, but they're really quite different. And when you read them in that light, you get so much more out of them. Well, I could go on like this, but let's talk about the letters, the epistles, which you'll find in the New Testament. Now, every letter is a correspondence, and it corresponds to a situation. And therefore, letters you have to read between the lines. You have to ask, why did this letter get written? Something was happening at the other end. And you read between the lines to find out what was going on in the place that the letter was addressed to. And then you begin to understand it. It's a bit like this, if I can explain it. Uh, I'm often walking along a street and I think someone behind me is talking to me. And I turn around and they've got the magic mobile phone to their ear and they're shouting into it. And I thought they were talking to me. Have you had that experience? Uh, now they're banished in some railway carriages in Britain, but uh, because they're so disturbing when somebody's talking loudly into a mobile phone near you. And it's so frustrating because you can only hear half the conversation. <laughs> and when you hear half the conversation, your brain is trying to fit the other half. What's the person saying to them? You can't help it. You want to know the whole story. Now, an epistle is exactly like that. It's only half the story. You're only reading one side of a correspondence. Let me try and give you an illustration of how easy it is to get one side of a conversation wrong. Hello? Hello. Has it arrived yet? Oh, great. How much does it weigh? Hmm. What color is it? Is it petrol or diesel? What did you think he was talking about? Most people think it's a baby at first. It's arrived. What did it weigh? And then petrol or diesel. See? Actually, it was a tractor. And had you listened to the whole conversation, you might have guessed that later on. But you see, listening in to one side of a conversation can easily lead you astray. You need to read them carefully. So when you read a letter, you're listening to one side of a, con of a correspondence. And you need to ask what's happening at the other end. And why is that letter being written? So I'm probably going to finish this part by looking at the longest letter in your Bible and indeed the longest letter that's ever been written in the ancient world. No other letter from the ancient world that we've recovered 
or rediscovered is as long as Paul's letter to the Romans. It's incredibly long. Now, if you ask why was that written, I've got a, a row of commentaries on Romans back home and every one of them gives me a different answer because there's no answer found in the letter. You have to find the answer from the letter and not from bits of it, but from the whole of it. Why did Paul write this letter? It's a very strange letter because he ne he'd never been to the Church of Rome. It wasn't one of his founding. We don't actually know who founded the letter of Rome. Later we know that Paul himself and Peter visited Rome and that they both died there. Peter was crucified just as Jesus had prophesied and Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen as well as a Jew. And Peter and Paul died in Rome, but they didn't found the church. And here is Paul writing the longest letter he ever wrote to a church he's never been to and had nothing directly to do with. Why? It's a very important question. Many Christians base their faith on Paul's letter to the Romans without ever asking why he wrote it. Now the answer to any letter and why it was written is either to be found in the writer or the readers, or even in some cases both. Were there any reasons within Paul himself that made him write this? Was he presenting the gospel he preached to them for their approval? Was he hoping that Rome would become his base from which he could evangelize the Western Mediterranean? Because it's, he says in the letter, I intend to go on from you to Spain. Was he presenting his credentials, as it were, for their approval and backing so that they would finance his ministry or at least bless it on its way? I don't think so. The mention of Spain is quite incidental to the main subject of the letter. Since he hadn't been to them, was he preaching the gospel to them so that he could introduce himself to them? No, because Paul says in another letter, I don't need letters of recommendation from anyone. So why did he write all this long, long letter to them? Was there something happening in Rome that needed it? Well, why was it his business? There were other apostles who could put it right. Have I got you at least puzzled and thinking? Why? Could I ask you, if you think you know why, I won't ask you anything, but if you think you know why, put your hand up. Dear me. And this is the most important letter in your Bible. Are you sure that you have no idea well, then I've got to tell you. You need to know the history of the church in Rome to know why he wrote it. And we do know the history of the church in Rome. It went through four phases, quite distinct from each other. We don't know who founded the church in Rome, what we do know from the Bible is that there were Jews in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost who were on that first day when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And it says that among those listening to Peter that day were Jews from Rome. 
And when 3,000 were converted, there must have been Jews among them from Rome. So the church in Rome, as far as we know, was founded by unknown Jews. And therefore, in phase one, was a Jewish church, composed of Jews who had come to believe in Jesus through Peter. Phase two, we know that Gentiles began to join them. And phase two was a mixed church of Jews and Gentiles who got on all right together. And uh, some of the imperial guards joined. Phase three came when the Emperor Claudius, been a television series in our country on called I, Claudius, brilliant series of the emperor before Nero. And Claudius banished all Jews from Rome. We're told that in Acts 18. And every Jew had to leave Rome under the emperor Claudius. And that included believing Jews, messianic Jews as we call them and they had to leave. So phase three in the Roman church was a Gentile church. What had begun as a Jewish church and become a mixed Jewish Gentile church was now a totally Gentile church. Years later, the emperor Nero invited the Jews back to Rome and they came back. Many of those who came back were Paul's friends. There's one whole chapter in Romans of greetings to friends in chapter 16. And some of them were Jews. There was one couple, now what was their name? Forgotten, it'll come back. I should look it up. Uh, and so phase four, should have been a mixed church again of Jew and Gen, but it wasn't. While the Jews had been away, a teaching had grown up in the church in Rome, which is still the curse of the church today. It was the teaching we've come to call replacement theology. And they had begun to be taught that God had rejected the Jewish people and that it was his will that his people on earth should now be a Gentile people. And therefore, when the Jews came back to Rome, the Jewish believers, they were not welcome. And Paul had been told this. And the danger was that in Rome, the capital of the empire, there'd be a split Two churches, a Jewish church and a Gentile church. And yet the gospel was about becoming one man in Christ Jesus. And since all roads lead to Rome and lead from Rome, the danger was that there'd be an almighty split in the church in Rome that would go down every road of the empire and there would be two churches of Christ. Now that was a disaster, which Paul was so burdened about. He'd been bringing Jews and Gentiles together in his ministry. He'd even gone to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 to settle this issue, that Gentiles could be part of the church without becoming Jews without being circumcised. He'd fought that battle that Gentiles and Jews could belong to Jesus without Gentiles becoming Jews. And he won that battle for us. And so when he heard that the church in the capital of the empire was about to split 
into two. And when his Jewish friends had gone back, said, we're not welcome, they're teaching that we Jews no longer belong to the church, that the church has replaced Israel, and that when the Jews were turned out of Rome, this was evidence that God was rejecting them and replacing them. And that's the teaching that is given in most churches in my country today, that the church is the new Israel. Have you ever heard that? That we have replaced the Jews as God's people on earth. It's a lie, it's not the truth, but it's been widely accepted right from the days when Paul was preaching. And the whole epistle is aimed to keep them together in one. And that tells you why he wrote. And now you will understand everything in that letter. And my time is gone. And I'm not finished. <laughs> but in the next session, I'm going to teach Romans chapter 11 which is the climax of the epistle and the point of it. And he makes it very clear why he's written it. Why then did it take 10 chapters to get to the point? Well, because he had never been to Rome and at that moment he couldn't come to Rome. He was going up to Jerusalem when he heard all this. And so he couldn't come. He said, I've wanted to come to you, but Satan has stopped it. I haven't been able to come. He said, I still may be able to come, but I'm writing to you to deal with this coming tragedy. <laughs>